I'm just in a mood. What What did we decide to talk about today? I'm blank. Uh, what? Met, we, no. What was it? Executive math, Robert. Yeah. Executive math and the and the perils that lie with. Is that them. like one plus one equals twenty two? Entry music. Da, 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 da. It's the Bob and Josh show. Executive math. It's a word I've used for a long time. I wanted to talk about it. It's that scary time when a number slips out, an executive grabs it and does some math, and that math comes out a little scary. It's literally, uh oh, what's going to happen? This episode's all about your responsibility in making sure that doesn't happen, your responsibility as a leader to the company and your team to help iron that situation out. Last point before we get to the episode. Bob is all in on his new brand. So if you don't check out our YouTube page and watch this, because it's live as soon as the audio part is live, and see Bob's moose shirt, which he's very happy and very proud of, you're missing something. And by the way, only 60% of the people that watch our videos are subscribed. Come on, if you're going to watch a video, just give us a subscribe. It's free, it's easy, and actually it helps us reach more people. So I thank you in advance for hitting that subscribe button. On to the episode. Executive math, I don't know if that's an official term. It's something that I've been using. And it... I can't think of a time that it's ever been beneficial. So what happens is you have a metric or something that you're tracking within your team, keyword within your team, and somehow it gets exposed to executives in uh, slides or something like that. And what I call executive math happens where it truly is the one plus one equals three. And it's not, it's not done with malintent. It's done with a lack of all the information about what that number or numbers mean. And those executives are just trying to do their job and figure out, okay, what does the future look like? So let me take this number and apply it. Looks like Bob's disagreeing. And we're going to get to this. Uh, it seems like I have sparked a, a fire under Mr. Galen here. So I'm going to zip my lip and hear what he has to say. No, no, it's, it's the, what was it? Mal intent. I disagree. Oh, okay. I, I think there are leaders who, whose hearts are in the right place and trying um just to communicate or incent yeah. or motivate. Uh, but I do think there's leaders. Uh, I've worked for, uh, one comes to mind that scarred me. I have scars on my back from Hank. Uh, and Hank pushed, his job was to push you till you broke. Mm. Cried like a baby. And overcommitted your family. Yeah. Uh, and that was his, so he was, and he would use any, any math or and i'm ex no i'm not exaggerating actually it was not good intent it was bad it was poor intent and now now he looked at it as like the job of the leader is to squeeze as much juice out of the lemon right as is humanly possible and i need to get incented by the amount of <laughs> lemonade that i make right <laughs> so no matter what <laughs> and if the lemon is dead yeah, it it don't matter. I did my job, and so so I all I'm getting at is I don't disagree with you. I think there's two sides to the intention: yeah. good yeah, intentions I, I, and bad intentions. Yeah. That's fair. I was I was trying to assume positive intent because I do feel like the topic can trigger people. So I do want to center on that it isn't always somebody's trying to grind you like that. Oftentimes, I don't know what the percentages, but I do think a fair amount of time, the reason that happens is it's your fault. So when executive math happens, that's not the executive's fault. It's your fault because you have not found a way to effectively communicate with that leader on a, the information, how it should be used, a handful of variables. So it got out of the bag. And it's your responsibility to control what's in the bag. And if something does get out of the bag, then you need to make sure that you corral it and maintain it. Don't just let it go wild. So it's going to be easy 
for us to say, oh man, they saw that number and pff, they're off and running. And that's just like putting your hands up in the air, like, oh, well, that happens and here we go. What I'm after here in this episode is this is your responsibility to not allow this to happen. And there's a I, handful of things that yeah. we can talk through to help you prevent this, but it's, it's hard work. Right. I mean, the one, I, I want to tee this up. I mean, you can say no, right? You could say, no, we can't do that. So you can respond with, like, I remember Hank, Hank was leveraging and, and he probably had this, you know, malintent, but, but he was trained that this was the way his job as a leader, there is a genre of leader. And I think a lot of leaders today, look at it. They don't trust their teams. They don't, they, they want to maximize the ROI. So they look at their job. Coaches do this. I need to squeeze all of the performance out of them. So I need to raise the bar. And so the executive math is, is intended to like really, really stretch people. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what I noticed in myself early in my career is I would never say no. So I would just roll over. Right. I, I didn't, I mean, I would just, okay, maybe I can do it. Uh, you know, imposter syndrome would kick in, you know, sort of, I didn't want to get into conflict. Maybe he's right, etc. So I would just, I would roll over uh, like a puppy uh, and just say, you know, that's fine. And I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or I was buying time or whatever it was. And I, I think, I think at the point of the tech communication at the point of the tech at executive math and starting with no. So the push in executive math is pretty firm, right? It's, it's confrontational. I think you almost have to confront back. Uh, you're not trying to create conflict, but the no is clear. Oh, right. Well, then what? Then, then maybe the 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 math goes back a tot. Well, can we do this? Oh, okay. And we're negotiating, but like firmness meets firmness. React yeah. to anything I've said and I, disagree so with I, me. I I have a similar history where I I remember the moment where I first told an executive no because it was one of those things that I just, I, I have this confidence about myself where like, if you say, Hey, we need to do this. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go do it. And I might kill myself yep. trying to do it, yep. but yep. I'm going to be like, sure. I, I'm not sure how I'm going to do that yet, but I'll figure it out and I'll make it happen. And as I grew and learned, I, I started to understand the boundaries that were realistic within myself and more importantly my my team so this this happened when my team size reached a larger number and i understood what i was signing up you know 50 70 people for and the weight and responsibility of that it was like i i can't let this happen so i then said no and to your point it was oh, okay cool well then what can we do? And that's the, that's the, the initial hurdle people have to get over is if you disagree, it doesn't mean someone's going to rip your head off. The most likely case is going to be like, Oh, all right. Well then what, what are the options and trying to right. work, work through it? So that's, um, that's the first thing. I, I mean, I joke, I teach leadership workshops. I, I forget when I did this, it was a long time ago, but I try to get folks I used to try to get folks to say no. And, and I think I'm a relatively good leader or an agile leader. And so I'm empathetic, et cetera. But part of the leader's job is to push. And so I would keep put, I, I think, and this is on the assume positive intent side, but I reserve the right as a leader to push you until you push back. Right. I, that's an okay strategy. Right. If you're not going to say no, well, then we can do more. If you're not going to say, well, what problem are you, Steve, Steven said, what problem are you going to solve? If, if we're not going to create dialogue, well, then you have capacity. So have the courage to put, to, to communicate from that, from that point of view. And if you don't, and there are some people that are incredibly, then I'm like, oh, okay, so you can do 20 more features. Well, I, 30, cool, 40, 50. And I'll, I'll keep going. And I'm like, at some point you need to say, stop. At what right. point will magic and pixie dust not be able to do that job? 
and and then we can walk back from that. But people, there's a lot of yes people in the world. Yeah, and that's where creating that bubble of safety and addressing it early as a leader and really encouraging people to speak with you. And one of the things you'll have to do as a leader is provide them with tools because they probably would like to disagree, but they just don't know how to handle it without, you know, getting super nervous or whatever. So you have to, as a leader, work hard to create this environment where people are comfortable saying things like that to you. But also to Bob's point, you do have this responsibility as a leader to achieve as much as reasonably possible. And oftentimes in life, sports, whatever it might be, there are things you can do you maybe didn't know you could do because you never tried. So it often requires someone to give you that little nudge and say, hey, let's just try it. Now, again, as a good leader, you've created a safe environment where if you fail, it's not the end of the world. If you fail, it's going to be small. So many times, some of these discussions are not a chance to fail small. They are big failures if it goes wrong. So that's where everything really ramps up. And that's when the importance of having that dialogue happens because it's not like you're going to knock a glass off the table and it shatters and spills a little milk. It's, th this is like, hey, we're going to bull bulldoze your house if it's right. wrong. You know, so there's no, it's a different type of game. Steven said something. He says, what, one challenge is when there's a board involved and the folks between the board and the teams um, have to commit to the board for next year's budget or, you know, whatever it is, commit. Uh, Etc., which leads to if we hire three more. So now I've committed to the board. The the inspiration that 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 Stephen's comment, or I don't know, inspiration, but what it made me think about was we need to train those folks to ask first, right? So for example, you know, so it's their bad if 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 I'm talking to the board, if I'm a VP talking to the board or the or a C level, and I commit to something without asking then that's not the team's bad or the pressure. That's my bad. Unless I clearly know what the arithmetic is, right? If I clearly know, and it, and I should, if I'm in a position to know what the safe math is for my team, like safe velocity, safe capacity, mm -hmm. then I can make safe commitments. But if I make an unsafe commitment or an inaccurate commitment, then shame on me. Yeah. And so, so I think pe then people saying yes below, beneath me just, just sort of reinforce that Ill, that bad behavior on my part, whether it's well intended or not well intended. I need to I need to stop doing that, and and there's nothing that stops me from talking to the board and saying, you know what, I need a day to go ask the team. I I wish we would have more language like that, with with the math. Even even when you have even when I had, I had figure I could make, you know, oh if we want to do that we would need to add three more teams. And it would take us a month, a quarter to ramp them up. I had math in my back pocket, but I still thought it was prudent on my part to validate it with the team because I'm not omniscient, right? I'm not, yeah. right? There may be some things I'm missing. So uh, that there's that lost art of, and it's uncomfortable. Like, can I, I can't answer you. So it's yes and no, but it's also answering now versus going and figuring it out. Mm -hmm. I think it's more powerful to say, all right, I'll get back to you in two days. Yeah. People want to answer right away. Yeah, it's it where to Bob's point where I see this most often is in the boardroom and especially early upon the formation of a new board through an acquisition or something like that. Board management is one of those things that's very important and it almost always gets to a point where the executives slam on the brakes and say like, wait a minute, who's running this company? Us or the board? And every board I've ever been a part of or worked with or anything, they're smart and they know they don't know the business. They trust the leaders to operate the business, but it's those leaders that um, haven't navigated the board dynamics yet. And for like that first 12 to 18 months, there's a lot of yeses with not enough research because it's just like hey you know we got to win the board we got to do this and and 
all of that stuff. And then there's always a moment where it flips and then things get, get smoother, but it, but it does take with new boards. Unfortunately, I've seen it like 12 to 18 months as leaders figure that out. Now that that's, that's for a new leader that hasn't been through something like that. For somebody that's been through it a handful of times, then it's completely different, but that's where, that's where a lot of challenges happen. And as Bob mentioned, it's your responsibility as a part of the information and education that's provided to your leaders so that they are armed and ready in moments like that, or know they can get it from you and get the right answer. So again, as this bubbles up, the responsibility does land on you to have command and control of those numbers. What, what would you do as a, as a leader, you, you need, you need a date from the team. So I'm, I'm pulling the scenario out. Yeah. So it, it's going to be a little rocky, but, yeah. um, so you, you need to go to a set of teams, uh, to figure out how long a project is going to take Josh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you want them to yes, you, uh, when, and they don't know, they don't know the answer. So what, what do you want? Do you want yes and figure it out later? And now you're going to commit something or do you want, do you want them to say, I don't know and go figure it out? What, what do you want? I, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the, I don't know. And my coaching to the team will be around the unit of measure. Um, okay. Let's use our yep. unit of measure as a quarter. Let's, make, let's make that the smallest we're going to get. Like if this is something that, you know, is obviously going to be a long project. Let's not pretend we're going to know everything we need to know in the two days. We're going to come up with some sort of guesstimate on what this is going to take. So, and so, 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 the, so, I so if I characterize like it, if I characterize it as lie to me or tell me the truth, oh, you'd yeah. say, tell me the truth. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause the yes is lying to me. Not, yeah. not in a malicious way, but it's a, okay. So now let's go, let's do that at a board level. We sort mm -hmm. of make these exceptions. Oh, I got to get the confidence of the board, blah, blah, blah. Get it, get it, get it, get it. But there's a choice there. There's a, sometimes we make things too complex, right? Well, it, I, it's, it's, go ahead. The, you know, the problem is that it's the short term comfort versus the long term comfort. You might get a quick win if in that meeting you say yes. But if you say yes, and to your point, you're lying because you don't really know, the likelihood of that yes becoming a reality is pretty low. So you've already set yourself up for failure. You want to set yourself up for a victory. And yeah, it might not be like, yes, that leader's awesome. I'm so glad we bought that company. Uh, good board members will recognize what a good leader is. And they, and they will respect and value someone that has the backbone, the willingness to say like, okay, cool. I gotcha. I, you know, I could give you a wild guess and it's three years from now, you know, but I, that's not reasonable. So let me go work with the people that can get us closer and then go from there. I, I think all I'm saying is if you look at it sometimes in, through a team lens and say, oh, of course we want that behavior. Then we bounce that same scenario up yeah. to a leadership board level. And then it gets, oh, it's, oh, it's nuanced. Oh, we need their confidence. No, it's about the same thing. Yeah. Right. It's lie or truth. I know there's nuance, but it's lie or truth. And what are we going to do? And I, I think truth telling. Like and truth telling is having the vulnerability to say, if you know, then tell, then say it. If you don't, then if you don't have an answer and you simply have to go check in with the people who do, well, then have the wherewithal to do that. Yeah. Uh, have the math, have that executive math or, or not. The other thing is, I think train folks. Uh, like what I what I've done with boards, it, it's not just with boards that I contact, for example. And I didn't train formally, but I was sharing with the board and with the leadership team what our dynamics were. So I said, "That's we're not going to do individual math anymore. So stop, stop, stop talking about how many developers we need. Mm -hmm. Start. To, we're going to start using team arithmetic, not mm -hmm. individual. Stop with the individuals, teams, and not and and you don't start the clock ticking until we have a team." 
Right. So the you know you don't oh we hired one developer for that team can what's that team gonna no we don't have a team yet and teams so we talked about team structuring a team it's how many people it's cross functional we talked about ramp up mm -hmm. like the first quarter that a team was together we're not going to count their contributions at full because it takes them time to ramp up then we'll yep. add them so we talked about we talked about team arithmetic. We talked about adding them, how long it took to hire them and to form them and to ramp them up. And at some point, then then we leveled the playing field, like the, the amount of requests were different, right? It wasn't, and there was nuance. It wasn't just, well, we need to do more, right? We need to do more. How many teams do you think it would take mm -hmm. to do that? It There's this like collaborative training or retraining about the dynamics. It's like when people play, uh, arithmetic like that, right? Executive arithmetic, it trivializes so much of the nuance of hiring people, et cetera, like getting them to be aware of ramp up time for a team, et cetera. So I think there's a training aspect or a, a communication aspect. They can't just trivialize things. Yeah. One of the things, um, as I was leading a group of product managers at my last large gig and, you know, Product managers get defined a bunch of different ways, but we didn't go the CEO of the product, uh, but, it, but it operates like that. And the message that we provided to our product managers of this is how you show you have things under control. One, have a plan and two, have command of it. You know, that, that's, and what is that, that command? It's, it's knowing what you're trading off, being able to have that, that, that discussion of, hey, if we want to do this, we're going to have to give this up. And it's not just, you know, something you put on a, on a wiki page and you don't reference. It's a roadmap or something out there, but showing you're actively managing all yep. of the ins and outs and everything that goes along with it. And that holds true all the way up the ladder. You know, if you go to a board, the same thing of like, hey, this is where we're going, this is what we're doing. It doesn't mean you have a, a 76 month plan in Microsoft project that is down to the to the pin drop, right? It, it's like, hey, we, we have a plan, we're comfortable with about this much in the future, here's how we're managing, we're working on the stuff that's in the background, we're gonna clear that up. And you just show that capability and everybody's, shoulders relax and there's now comfort and it creates that dialogue as opposed to just yes or no. Absolutely. I, I love what Steven said. He said, Hey, exec or board member, how much revenue growth are we going to have in three years across the next years with hundred percent accuracy? Tell me now. Right. And the answer is, I don't know. Right. <laughs> right. And, and, and so, and that's the flip. No, but in, all joking aside, that's actually some of the flip side discussions. This is, so the business is dynamic and complex and unpredictable. Yes. Guess what? Welcome to, welcome to my world. And this mm -hmm. isn't an excuse for, I'm not being willy nilly. I'm not looking, but there's complexity here. Hiring, skill sets. We can hire front end engineers, but it's incredibly difficult to find good back end engineers. That's a reality that we have. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll just throw money at it. Get them, you know, we'll get them from Saskatchewan. No, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with Saskatchewan. Maybe I should start recruiting in Saskatchewan. I didn't know that exactly. it was a hotbed. <laughs> it's gonna, a hotbed for that. We have to make a trip there. <laughs> exactly. So, but, but that kind of shared respect, shared nuance, I think is, is the place that you need to get to. That trivialization yeah. is a bad place. That just, that one way push. I don't care. This is what you get paid. But I think as a leader or a technologist, we have to push back on that in the right way. Yeah. Yeah. Or did we, I may have taken us off no, your executive I, math track. It's, it's back on. you know, the thing I just wanted to make sure was that everybody understood what the heck I was talking about. Cause I don't know if other people use that, that, that term. And then the most important thing that I wanted people to understand is the responsibility you have in preventing and or corralling that situation from, from happening. Don't, don't just wait for something bad to happen. You have to get out in front of it and you have to make sure 
everybody understands what we're talking about and give them clarity and again have that command of the plan where as things change you can make the right uh, ins and outs that are necessary to keep things moving in the right direction so that's a that's what i was after is making sure that the executives it's so it's so easy to just blame the executives and yes to bob's point that he made in the first half is there are some people that are going to try and use it against you whether you like it or not but in most cases they're trying to do the best with what they have and the reason they don't have the best answer is because you haven't given it to them yet so they're so they're trying to do a job and they don't have all of the info so you have to give it to them help them understand enable them to do their job that's a training that's another way of framing what i was talking about like the cross training or the cross understanding um it's sort of like the technology i like exposing architectural elements and sprint reviews over time because it's a cost that we have to bear or refactoring costs and and people say well they don't care about that the execs don't care about that and i'm like they may not but they have to mm -hmm. because we may be investing 50 percent of our time and effort in refactoring and they're paying for that and we need to be able to communicate that to them and what it is and what we're doing and why it's important what the business value is right as opposed to visible features and things yes and they need and they need to listen and when they ask for something they need to start understanding you know what we need to fix that and it's a back end this Oh, you know what? We need to do that, but it's damn hard for the tech folks, right? It's I'm not asking them to build a, a doghouse. I'm asking them to build a mansion, mm -hmm. and, and it, I and we need to get it built. But it's going to it's going to be hard, and over time, if they're really listening, and we're doing a good job of showing and training and cross training and empathy, and we need to be empathetic from their point of view too for the business dynamics, then we start we start collaborating effectively in this you have that mutual respect yeah bob 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 hit the one word well i guess there's two words it's a phrase that i want to make sure everybody here heard i'm going to spend a couple minutes on it is business value that is the number one issue i've seen with engineering teams and the architectural work that they want to do or need to do oftentimes it's want to do and the time and effort is not put in to convey the business value that this work creates. How does this rewriting of our whatever layer, how is that gonna make life better for our customers? Ultimately for our customers, maybe they don't see it and feel it, but it allows us to be more responsive in support or it allows us to be more responsive every, every first of the month because everything's slow, because everybody's doing their math and reports and all that jazz. And that's where you as a leader or you as a product manager or product leader do not allow anything into your plan where you're doing something because an architect said we should that is just room for danger because you don't understand the value which means you likely don't understand everything that's going to go into making it happen and there are times i am guilty of this trust me where I'm forecasting future problems that we have. So I want to build this architecture that's going to prevent us from struggling when we have that problem, when the reality is we're not going to have that problem for five years. And when that becomes a problem, then we'll fix it. So it also helps the engineering team and the architects think and realize like, okay, yeah, yes, it would be cool to build it like that because we know that's the right way but we don't actually need that right now. So let's not invest there. So that connection with architectural choices and the actual value that is delivered to our customer, that's been really sticky for every company I've been a part of. And it takes the product team to not accept items that are just because someone said so. And then working with that engineering team to tease out and understand oh so you mean it's going to do this yeah. hell yeah we should have done that six months ago right that's that hidden value that people don't know because like oh it's too complex you're not an architect or you know i am just a product manager i'm never gonna right. get it like that's not okay to say i think that's part of the executive math 
is this ability to communicate you know things like refactoring and architectural value security security risks in not just in, in business value but in numbers that execs like complexity numbers sprint numbers scope numbers uh, over time so that we can be talking about level of effort level of investment return on investment etc and and really the gain that understanding uh okay. steven said something in the chat josh uh, maybe it's something we could twist to a little pivot thoughts on funding teams versus projects so we, we were talking about team arithmetic or, or executive arithmetic maybe go to the the funding side just for a little bit what any reactions to that yeah the 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 transition to funding teams opens the door for executive math right of like oh so i have this unit if i add five more units that means i get this right yep. and so then that's where you have to understand the complexity increasing as the team size goes up or the number of products that are being worked on or whatever those variables are it's not linear uh, we certainly know that to be true but you have to coach and educate that i don't like to fund projects because we don't even know if that project's going to be a reality we could you know move forward in three months and realize that was a terrible plan so what I do and what I build is teams that are, and this is a generalization, that are black boxes where we can give them a complex business problem. And on the other side is going to be this amazing piece of software that helps the user save, you know, a hundred right. hours a week or what, who knows, right? But but that's that's what happens because so much changes and there's so much that you don't know and as you move forward in time you discover these things so just fun teams that you know you can give them big scary hard issues and they'll crush it i mean that's my lineage is i don't want to fund projects anymore i mean to Steve, i'm sure in steven's case you know it's a good question and there are organizations many that fund projects they they're still in a project management view and that's fine uh, if I can avoid that, I want to avoid that. Mm -hmm. I want to normalize to funding teams, uh, and, and teams equate to capacity, right? And that's our capacity. And so that's side one, how many teams, what capacity do we need? What, what is the release plan look like? And then how are we going to leverage that capacity? Is that product decision? Is it value streams? Is it, uh, is it products and how are we going? And that's not overload the teams, right? and etc. So we're funding teams to support at a capacity level to support this. That gives us the math should stop at some point. Oh, can we squeeze more juice out of the lemon? No, <laughs> there's a limited amount of juice. If you want more juice, then we can add more teams that has more cost. But there's also these dynamics to your point, Josh, I think you were making like skill set dynamics, hiring dynamics, ramp up dynamics, things like that. So it's not linear. It's not simplistic. You know, welcome. Like we need to, we need to jump for you, you know, for decades, we've been pulled. Technologists need to understand the business, right? They need to be empathetic to the executives. Guess what? It's reciprocal. The executives need to jump into my game a little bit. And, and I think that'll make us better partners. And that won't happen if you aren't honest, if you're just a yes person, then there's, then why would there be any empathy? Right? Because it's, it's like, yep. you don't need any cause you, you know, and then, oh, why didn't you deliver on that thing you said you could? And it just becomes this vicious cycle that you can't win, but creating that honest relationship with your leadership team, whoever it might be, is how you end up winning in the long run. Both as a company, I would, and I was just thinking yeah. as a leader, as an individual, like it may mean if, if you're in an organization that doesn't want the truth, you may need to find another organization or find another company. But I don't think then you fall to just saying yes, yes, maybe in the short term, maybe your short term strategy is yes, but find a place. There are places that, that not only can handle the truth, but it, but reward the truth. That's what we want to, that's how we want to operate as a company. This we're, we're truly in this partnership role. Yep. It, well, and you know, I think back to, I mean, you are well aware of a place that I worked where the truth didn't matter. 
it was what was perceived to be the truth by a leader and that was that's what was going to happen that's what was going to get committed to the board that's what we were going to deliver on but surprise surprise we were always behind yep you know because the truth was delivered but tossed out the window exactly did we cover this one josh do you think i feel i feel pretty good i feel pretty good you i know, feel, we talked I feel, about yeah. what it is your responsibility in the role common signs you'll see and, and and i feel like we gave people a lot of like here's what you can do which is ultimately what i want is people to be able to walk out of here whatever it is and say like okay cool like i've got this thing i think i can go help with now uh and the medicasters there there will be a link in the post that has a, i have like a team of arithmetic uh, blog post that's an example of a lower end of this, but I think I think you might find it interesting. So go take a look at that when this thing uh, gets posted. Other than that, Josh, let's take let's take a fork in this. What okay. do you think? I like it. All right. So from beautiful downtown Cary, North Carolina, I'm Bob. Hold it a second, everyone. I'm Bob Moosey and Galen. <laughs> if you listen, everyone, before I do my part of that. Please go to YouTube and watch this. It is important. It's very important. Number one, you have to respect the brand that Bob has adopted with the suspenders, and he is all in on it. I'm all is, in, baby. He is equally all in on the moose. So, like, yes, you might listen to us in your car, but when you get home, whatever it is, like, turn this episode on on YouTube and trust me. It is good, and it's only going to get better. <laughs> All right. And and from rainy Fuquay, Verena, North Carolina, I'm Josh Anderson. Shake. And bake. Take care, y'all.